Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of Affinity's evening webinar series in recognition of International Peace Day. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and to all descendants who have cared for this place since creation. We also honour all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. My name is Craig Foster, former Socceroo, and now member of Affinity's Advisory Board, I'm delighted to say. For those of you joining us for the first time, let me briefly introduce you to Affinity Intercultural Foundation. Affinity was formed by a group of young Muslim Australians in the year 2000. Affinity's aim is to promote multiculturalism and foster intercultural and interfaith dialogue by building bridges between different groups in society. Tonight's webinar episode is in collaboration with UNAA New South Wales, UNHCR and the Sydney Peace Foundation. Like Affinity, these organisations work to promote world peace, community harmony and social cohesion. Without further ado, I'd now like to introduce tonight's well-known facilitator, Hugh Rimmington. Hugh is a familiar face to millions of Australians. He's an award-winning journalist, humanitarian, news presenter and foreign correspondent of many years' experience. Currently, he's the National Affairs Editor at the Ten Network. Within his 40-year career, Hugh has been a foreign correspondent and news anchor for the Nine Network and CNN, and a Canberra-based political editor for Ten. Hugh has received numerous awards, both nationally and internationally, including two Walkleys, a Logie, Honours from the Human Rights Commission, and the UN Association Media Award. Welcome, Hugh. Well, Craig, thank you very much and thank you for all the work that you do and have done and uh, will continue to do. It's great to have you there on the advisory board of the uh, Affinity uh, Foundation. It's great to be with everyone here tonight. Um, tonight we're going to be discussing the voice of impartiality, maintaining peace building in a turbulent world. Uh, peace operations and peace building provide hope to areas that are emerging from conflict. One of the principles of UN peace operations is impartiality. And that's a difficult concept to maintain when you're in very volatile and uncertain environments in these situations. Australia has grappled with the uh, dilemmas that are involved in peacekeeping and peace building for a long time, a proud record of involvement in over 60 peace operations since the UN was formed some 75 years ago. So on the International Day of Peace, we're going to consider how can Australia best contribute impartially to peace building operations regionally and also across the world. We have fantastic uh, speakers to join us tonight. Um, Louise Auburn is the representative of the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, she has responsibilities covering the Pacific, based from Canberra. Also joining us is Dr. Susan Bankey, a council member of the Sydney Peace Foundation and a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney. Uh, and they will share their insights on the importance of this significant day. And before we begin our conversation, though, I'd like to let you know that uh, you are certainly welcome to be part of all of this by uh, bringing some questions to us. Uh, there is a system. If you want to write your questions in the chat box that is part of uh, the, the, the sort of little machinery there at the bottom of your screen, use the hashtag AskAffinity and we'll try to answer them in the allocated Q&A session at the end. But first of all, welcome to Louise and to Dr. Susan. Thanks very much for having me. <laughs> and just like that, you pop up out of nowhere. Look, fantastic to have you with us. Maybe I can throw it to you to start off with, uh, Louise. What is the relationship, in your view, between peace and justice? Can one exist without the other? Uh, well, thanks, uh, Hugh, for having me, and uh, thank you, Craig, for the introduction. I think um, uh, my job is actually easy because all the answers I can bring to your very complex questions, I can only draw from what um, people have told me. And um, after 20 years of 20 plus years of working with refugees in particular and displaced people, stateless people, they've told me um, what peace means to them and whether or not justice is a component of it. So how about I draw from, you know, my most recent experience, the Rohingya refugees in late 2017, you know, a, a million uh, Rohingya crossed a um, very narrow river to get into Bangladesh in um, horrible circumstances, many of them um, physically and mentally uh, very hurt, 
after decades of deprivation, etc. And when you ask them uh, what peace means to them or justice, and of course you don't ask in those terms, you ask, what do you need? The first things they will describe um, is a sense of security, the need to having reached shore where they feel they can expect some kind of protection from the country of Bangladesh. And let's not forget also that the first people to receive them were not humanitarians in the formal sense, the UN or NGOs. The first people to receive them were border communities. Bangladeshi fishermen, families on the border with Myanmar who were there to receive them, to share the little food that they had, the shelter that they had. That's a million people arriving in the span of a few weeks with um, horribly desperate uh, needs to be tended to, from health, to food, to shelter, to reunifying with family members that have been scattered. So that's peace. Peace is the start of protection, but peace is the lasting peace, the sense that you have that you are no longer going to be at risk of displacement. You are no longer going to be at risk of persecution for who you are. Where does justice fit into this? If you were to ask a Rohingya woman what she needs once she's found a safe haven, if you will, in Bangladesh, in the village, in Cox's Bazar, on the peninsula, once she's reunified with a family member, she will tell you something else. She will say, and she will describe what it is that she's undergone, a missing family member. Her husband she can't find, she, who has disappeared, and she has no idea where he is. A son that she saw beaten in front of her, or what, what's happened to her personally, the having had to witness violence, or in some of the extreme cases, and unfortunately they're not anecdotal, um, many women, many girls were raped, were beaten, um, uh, and forcibly moved uh, onward out of their villages after their houses had been burned. Justice there, if you listen very carefully, needs to recognize what people have undergone. And with that starts a dialogue and communication with people about what will make things better. That acknowledgement of what's happened goes to, I think, what essentially refugees, displaced people, and I think anyone who's been affected by conflict or persecution goes to the very root cause of what actually, you know, provoked their displacement. Discrimination, exclusion, the fact that your own nationality has been deprived, taken away from you, uh, the sense that you have lost the right to return to where you came from, Bangladesh being their home. That's what they were all describing. So justice, in the way I've understood it from refugees, from displaced people, from stateless people, it, it is linked to a fight against impunity. But deeply, it's, I think, the need to be recognized for what's happened and uh, a pathway to uh, remedying this a pathway to ensuring that it won't happen again and that you can reinstate that person in uh, you know, a context of normalcy, where they can raise a family, uh, where they have access to basic services, their dignity is restored, where um, you see yourself, you can project yourself with the future. I think peace and security, therefore, in those terms, I think they're interlinked, they're, they're absolutely essential, one and the other. I think, at, personally, I think it becomes a bit theoretical Do you tackle one before the other. As long as you understand that the point of view begins and probably ends with people who've been impacted by conflict. Does it, you speak there of acknowledgement. So there are, seems to me just listening to you that there are two levels of acknowledgement. One is that they are acknowledged by uh, those who immediately meet them as they cross the border, which is probably a reasonably low threshold then that they'd be acknowledged more widely by the world, ultimately that they're acknowledged, that their losses are acknowledged by the very people who've rejected them and, and spat them out of the country. Um, how difficult uh, 
is it to go from the stage of being acknowledged by the world that they've suffered uh, injustices and been thrown out of their homelands to the point where there's sufficient acknowledgement to allow a return? Uh, different, I, different contexts, different conflicts took on different routes to reconciliation, which is essentially what we're talking about here. Um, I think it's still it's keeping with the, the, the um, situation of the Rohingya, a lot of effort has gone into documenting not just since the massacres, the violence, the exodus of Rohingya refugees, but a lot had been done before to document this continuous erosion of people's rights uh, uh, that ended up with you know, a denial of nationality. So the uh, international recognition by humanitarians, you say, is a low threshold. It's not always, it's not a given either. That also requires quite a bit of work of active listening and responding to what, not to what I have to offer, but what people are asking in terms of what they need. So, and I'm sure we'll explore that a little bit further in our, in our discussion. International recognition creates this momentum of, um, pressure and expectation, but also creation of pathways for dialogue, for communication. And I think at this stage, we're not quite through, you know, ensuring that um, uh, the country of origin, um, Myanmar in this case, you know, it, it, you know, really ensures to tackle and to take on board recommendations that went to the very root causes of the conflict. Recognition of nationality, recognition of basic human rights, that dialogue, that communication is enabled by quite a few actors, the UN, obviously, but also, you know, members of the international community, that some key states that um, are, we'll use the, you know, the term of advocacy and um, political dialogue to be able to make sure that that conversation is not just meaningful as a communication, but actually that we start seeing things on the ground, laws being changed, um, work being done with communities in, you know, uh, uh, communities of origin who will be made ready to receive refugees, Rohingya refugees, when they do hopefully come back home, that there will be some kind of community dialogue as well. So you're right to point out, you know, the, the different levels of um, understanding, recognition, uh, and action that needs to take place for a, a real, you know, coming back to the very solutions to um, to the problem. Uh, Dr. Susan Bank, you've looked at a number of cases, including long-term uh, conditions like the uh, Bhutanese refugees out of a country which is often uh, seems like a very benign part of the world, but there are refugees from Bhutan. Uh, given that that's been a long time, uh, what's your sense of the question of can there be peace uh, where there is no justice. Uh, first of all, I want to just thank the Affinity Foundation for having me and thank you for your terrific moderation so far. For you. Uh, first thing that I want to say is that it is a tenet of the Sydney Peace Foundation that peace should come, should be accompanied by justice. So I'm really delighted that you asked the question. It's often by non-scholars, people hear about peace studies and they think of a bunch of hippies with their bandanas <laughs> and their peace signs. And what, what peace scholarship has shown, although I confess to not being an expert, is that pursuing peace requires discipline. It requires deep, concerted action in order to bring about peace. And it also requires that those who are involved in those actions, much as Louise pointed out, are involved in talking about the injustices. So it's, I mean, I also take Louise's point that one cannot necessarily happen without the other, but we don't necessarily know the order in which it's going to happen. But what a peace scholar, what a peace activist is doing is not just marching in the street with long hair and a bandana, but really talking about what, what it takes to bring to bring justice to a situation so that a true peace, a real peace, can move forward. Now, you mentioned the Bhutanese. Um, this, this is a, a terrific example of where peace with justice has not 
necessarily occurred yet, but we are moving in that in that direction. The the ethnic Nepalese population of Bhutan departed the country some 30 years ago. There's a big question about whether that departure was expulsion or whether that was um, willing willing members of the population. Depending on who you talk to, either the Bhutanese side or the, um, the refugee side, you're going to get very, very different answers. What we see now with the distance of time and resettlement, I mean, Louise might want to jump in on that, is finally some of the anger, some of the um, civic conflict that occurred over the course of decades has finally started to mitigate on the personal level. We see that government officials are starting to reach out to former um, friends and colleagues who, who left 30 years ago and starting to talk to them to say, you know, maybe there were problems on both sides. I don't want to comment too much on what's going to move ahead for the Bhutanese because I think we have a long way to go. But I'm, I'm comforted to see that the distance of time and, um, and physical distance seems to be potentially moving in the, in the direction of reconciliation, which would really potentially bring some combination of, um, of justice and reconciliation. Right now, there is peace. So there's an example where the, the peace has come first. Uh, I, I think in the public mind, there is a view of peacekeepers as uh, the ones that gain big attention are, are very heavy military interventions. You think of things like East Timor, you go back, uh, another one in, in uh, Somalia, for example, was a multinational national uh, effect. I was there at Mogadishu at the airport. It, it was a monumental Hollywood-like uh, performance of equipment that went in there. But I wonder how much you perceive um, advocacy words as being essential in this peacekeeping, peace building process, and how much can you advocate for something while maintaining impartiality, which is crucial to the process? So I throw it back to you, Susan, but I, I'd be very interested in your views as well, Louise. Look, I think that's um, an incredibly tricky one, and you're you're asking the right agency whether Louise is comfortable talking about it, because in fact. The UNHCR, just by nature, by the nature of recognizing people as refugees, is in some ways an acknowledgement that there is a failed or a failing state on the other end, on the end where the refugees have left. So just by the delivery of humanitarian aid, it's very difficult to not become entirely politicized. I think, uh, I, I, I think it's important for Louise to answer this question herself. But I think that there's impartiality is, is one of the tenets of humanitarian aid. I mean, that's what humanitarian aid organizations um, espouse. They have principles that talk about these tenets of neutrality and impartiality. But in situations where um, conflict has been the root of what creates refugee situations, it's, it's very difficult not to come across as um, choosing one side over another. And I mean, I can tell you back to the Bhutanese example is that the, the government of Bhutan until today blames UNHCR for the problems that created that refugee population. I, I disagree with that position because I am a scholar that has spent a lot of time working with Bhutanese refugees. But what I'm saying is that just by nature of creating the space where refugees can cross a border and provide them humanitarian aid, somebody's going to get angry. But I'd love to hear your take on that, Louise. Well, there's the invitation, Louise. <laughs> um, when you, um, I think there a lot of things came out in um, both the question and the and the answer. Um, I think it is important. I mean, the, the the crux of everything that we're talking about is how do you achieve peace? You know, something that's lasting, etc. And I think um, a lot of pieces come into this. Um, there's distinction between the roles and responsibilities and mandates across the UN, for example. Sometimes we, we reduce the UN to the Security Council, reduce the UN to the General Assembly, but actually, if you just look at the um, number of complementary mandates across the UN from um, those that carry a humanitarian mandate, like UNHCR, you know, dealing very specifically with 
refugees and displaced people through to you know agencies that deal with food security agencies that deal with health etc through the development spectrum but also the peace and security uh, um, angle to uh, to efforts towards peace peace and security if it were only achieved through security means we should have achieved peace a long time ago because there's one thing we do know how to invest in it's guns and mortar but that mm. obviously security alone a security approach alone rarely achieves peace i draw your attention to the sahel right now there are multiple security strategy military strategies currently at play in the Sahel, across the Sahel, from uh, uh, a UN effort and presence through to bilateral, you know, military arrangements through the Sahel, G5, the five Sahel states coming together militarily, etc. That alone um, not only doesn't address, you know, maintaining peace and keeping insecurity at bay, it also risks scaling back some advances we are desperately needing to make in terms of development. Um, when you look at Niger, for example, a country in point, 189th on the Human Development Index. You can't have lower. All of the pieces need to come together. Advocacy. You asked the point very specifically about advocacy. I think one of the important things about advocacy, if you're meant to persuade, you're going to have to listen. And listening again, I come back to who do you listen to? Too often, we listen to those who are actually waging war, those who are actually driving conflict. The people impacted by conflict, first and foremost, have quite a bit to say. They have quite a bit to say because they will point the way to how to address what will make things calmer, safer, sustainable. Uh, villagers, communities, Interfaith dialogue will often yield a lot more solutions than would a security uh, discussion in and of itself. So, so how, how do you give a voice like that in a time when there is conflict, insecurity, uncertainty, fear? Uh, we've seen how that operates. How do you elevate those voices that you speak of that may provide a path to a more peaceful outcome when there's all that other stuff going on? I've got a very stark example that comes immediately to mind when you ask that question. Central African Republic, um, entire communities were besieged, just as in Syria, in a totally different context. Uh, but let me stick with the Central African Republic. Communities surrounded by uh, a, a different group really uh, imminently about to attack these communities with no way out for these communities and um, one of the things that um, uh, two things happened finally you know um, a high level urgent call for an extraction getting people out of harm's way and that was done through dialogue but first and foremost you know what the prerequisite was we needed boots on the ground actual uh, military elements able to secure a perimeter to be able to actually draw people out safely and bring them somewhere else. That's the physical aspect of it. Another thing happened as well to prevent uh, a recurrence of two communities um, and one obviously more at risk than the other in many of these asymmetrical uh, conflicts was um, bringing in two heads of um, faith groups. In the case of uh, Central African Republic, you know, the head of a Christian group and the head of um, uh, 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 the Muslim group, very um, recognized, um, uh, respected individuals who began a conversation between communities women were part of that conversation women who, who needed desperately to access a market to be able to trade to be able to feed the families and that was the motor behind the, the dialogue those are so many um 
levels of you know conflict resolution that have a lot to do with advocacy but advocacy understood as dialogue and communication and sometimes yes you know, military or forceful means are required in extreme circumstances. But to, um, uh, uh, um, you know, um, take the steam out of conflict, oftentimes you go right to the people who actually are first impacted uh, by the conflict. They have a lot more at stake and they will put themselves on the line to be able to negotiate an outcome. Interesting. Uh, we're going to just pause for a second to introduce another face <laughs> to our conversation. Uh, and I'm going to introduce a, a former peacekeeper, a, a veteran of peacekeeping operations in the Middle East, a director currently of peace and security at the United Nations uh, Association of Australia, uh, Tim Ford AO, to share with us UNAA New South Wales Peace Perspective video. Here he is. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to, uh, to witness this uh, wonderful discussion on uh, the uh, International Day of Peace. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to introduce uh, the Peace Perspective video, which uh, you're going to see next. This is one of three videos that have been developed by the United Nations Association of New South Wales in partnership with uh, the uh, Sydney Rotary Peace Building Group and uh, Know My Group. They've been released today, these three videos, to mark the International Day of Peace. And, Following an initiative by our Director of Program, Sahira, we approached a wide range of individuals and organisations to give their diverse perspectives on the action Australians to, can do to assist peace, with, both within the community uh, and across the world as humanitarians and peacekeepers, with the aim to inspire all of us uh, to play our part in uh, shaping peace together. We had a wonderful response, uh, which has been edited to create three fascinating uh, videos. And I commend all of those who helped us make these videos and were involved in them. And I encourage all of you to view them, either today or in the future on, uh, on social media. And my thanks to Affinity for including uh, this one video tonight in today's event. Uh, thanks very much and back to you, Hugh. Fellow global citizens, my name is Dr. Patricia Jenkins, President of the United Nations Association of Australia, New South Wales, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Peace Perspective video, which is part of our special celebrations of the United Nations International Day of Peace. Celebrating this day is of great significance as peace is at the very heart of the work of the United Nations. So as we commemorate this most important day, we must take time to reflect on our past, present and future. We must remember those who have sacrificed their lives in the name of peace and those who continue to provide, protect and preserve peace around the world. In my opinion, the best way to support peace is for 193 member states of the United Nations to implement and action the agreements and the resolutions that they've endorsed, including those that come from peace operations, peacekeeping and peace building. And if you don't communicate well with your team and with the, the local Malian people, you have very little room for success. Communicating with people means understanding their culture and what is acceptable for their backgrounds. And to do this, you need really great advice. The world first showed its concern for refugees at the end of the Second World War. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes Article 14, which says that every human being has the right to seek asylum. Unless we start to treat refugees properly as a world, um, then the chances for peace are very slim. In Afghanistan, uh, I'm confronted every day by the very real consequences of conflict. Peace in Afghanistan would mean that the millions of people in humanitarian need would be able to go about their daily lives without fear. It would mean that families could go to the market uh, to buy food for, for their meals without having to navigate through armed checkpoints. 
It would mean children could walk to school without having to worry about IEDs beside the road. We have an obligation to become advocates for peace and to become advocates for vulnerable people who are living in war-torn countries around the world. The International Day of Peace provides an opportunity to reflect on our shared humanity and renew our commitment to peace. Australia has been at the forefront of international peace and security since the United Nations was established. Peace is not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. Police can make a significant contribution to these efforts, but to be truly effective, there must be a peace to keep, local buy-in, and the international support for long-term investment. Peace is important for Australia today and for our future as we want future generations of Australians to grow up in a world free from fear and tension, where opportunity is abundant and marginalisation is non-existent. Peace is not a given. We, we all are responsible and need to own our own commitment to building and promoting all peace. And probably most important is to build resilience. This includes the community or population affected by a fracture of peace, and also resilience in those who seek to effect a peaceful resolution, be it to a domestic or international peace dilemma. Thank you. Some powerful voices there, and uh, and thank you to Tim Ford for bringing those uh, to us as voices from all over um, the region. And it's interesting to see the, see so many Australian accents in all these interesting parts of the world. Uh, I, if I can put to you, Dr. Susan Banke, um we're living in unprecedented times, as we keep get, getting told, and that's because they are unprecedented times. To what degree do you think uh, COVID has changed the arithmetic? Uh, borders are going up and being enforced more for a whole bunch of reasons. Governments tend to be looking more inwardly because they're dealing with economic crises as well as health crises. Um, is this having any impact as you perceive it in this, this year for uh, the homeless, the stateless, the people who need help? Um, thanks for that question. So on border policies, um, what, what, what COVID has wrought is what migrant and refugee advocates um, would hope they would never have to face, which is an actual real justification for some restrictions. There have been in the past xenophobic narratives that have been brought out in order to justify the closure of borders. But the, the truth is that COVID has created a situation in which some restrictions make sense. The way that countries are carrying that out um, has has created in in most places, particularly, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, it has been in the most restrictive ways, and frankly, for good reasons that have to do with the way that 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 COVID manifests itself. What we also see, however, is that it's not just as simple as closed borders. Really, much like many of the other sort of elements of policy. The privileged, um, the, 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 these policies fall along privilege lines, on race lines, on ethnicity lines. It's not just about border restrictions, but about the treatment of migrants and refugees. So for example, here in Australia, there have been a lot of studies recently that have shown that the way that the government has treated migrants and refugees in the aftermath of COVID has been to make their lives much, much, much more difficult, very difficult to leave the countries, and yet very difficult to stay. Uh, social services, job keeper, et cetera, has not been provided, has not been made available to those populations. At the same time, students and migrants are the sectors that are in fact the best, uh, are, 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 those, are, those are migrants and students that have propped up those sectors of the economy. So what, what, what we see COVID doing is, is um, creating even more difficulty than, than prior for those populations. I don't want to sound too doom and gloom about it, but I also wanted to mention something that telescopes this back into the broader question about the, the relationship between COVID and conflict. And here what we see is that these 
what we can call these million cuts, the way that COVID is creating um, populations that are treated differently, populations that were always treated differently, but now COVID has made that worse. What that is creating is the kind of personal anger that can lead to conflict. So Sarah Chase is a well-known author who has written about how the, per the perception of corruption is often what leads to terrorism. This idea that when you see that you are being treated differently for reasons that have nothing to do with fairness, that you don't merit the treatment you're getting, this is what causes seething anger. And we can see this across the globe right now. This is not just in conflict situations in sort of the most terrible places in the, in the world, but really across the world. But the, the way that these treatments are manifesting differently. Now, I, I am not able to speak specifically on what the result of COVID will be in conflict. There's actually a terrific website at the Council on Foreign Relations that's examining those. So for example, Henry Kissinger has argued that he believes that the global new order will actually create uh, more uh, a shifting and perhaps a more positive global order we see Joseph Nye, another well-known political scientist, arguing, no, there's not going to be any change in the global order. And, I mean, I think my short version is that we are going to have to keep looking at, uh, we are still in the trees, right? We, we, we can't really answer the question yet about whether COVID is going to change the global order in such a way that it's going to create more peace or it's going to create more disruption. What, what we can see, however, is COVID is absolutely going to cause depression, a global depression. And the results of global depression, unfortunately, are most often poor indicators for peace. Often conflict comes from times when, uh, when there's a global depression, there's more of a, a fight about resources, and when resources are scarce, that can cause more problems. Susan, uh, Louise, I should say, if I can, uh, if I can put that to you, do you have a sense of uh, both the immediate effect of COVID on refugee movements and, the, and refugee needs, and, and also if you'd like to speculate into the future as to whether uh, it, it may cause more stresses that will lead to more of the things that have just been described there by Susan? Well, most definitely, you know, despite the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire, and I think that was quite visionary of him. I mean, it took a leaf from the African countries having called 2020, you know, the year to silence the guns. And I obviously we took a leaf from that. And, um, you know, this call for a global ceasefire probably had a lot of things in mind at the outset of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it was uh, to the, the basic notion there is that if wars, and persecution don't stop, people do need to flee, to go to where things are safer. The very movement, mobility of people is at the, is at the um, root of efforts to stem the pandemic. So everything being interlinked, um, wars continue, persecution continue, people have to move, they flee, they flee somewhere. Borders are closed, as Susan has pointed out, and in fact, you know, if you look at, um, you know, hard statistics, you know, of 190 plus countries, 160 of them have put in place and growing, have put in place, you know, strong border restrictions. Now, some of these states have put in exceptions for asylum seekers. Um, that's also very, that's just practical, knowing that uh, people have to go somewhere, particularly these countries who, you know, share a border with um, a, a country that has been producing refugees, but the conflict is not resolved, um, etc. But very few examples, and examples, unfortunately, I think, are, are, are dwindling. But exceptions are possible. And I, uh, I, I point out very recently to an effort, because my point now is going to, unless we're working together and harmonizing how we manage, because it's entirely legitimate for sovereign states to manage their borders, how you manage them, keeping in mind that some people exceptionally and 
and that's now couched in international law exceptionally and I think it was pointed out in the video we just saw as well it's a fundamental right to seek asylum I hope I never have to use that fundamental right but I hope it exists when I do need it it's a fundamental right to seek asylum just recently you know um, we had vessels uh, with Rohingya refugees lost at sea uh, 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 with uh, countries in the Andaman Sea, you know, almost tripping over each other not to do anything. And actually, that's just an echo of what's happening in the Mediterranean, for example, where, you know, European states are tripping over each other, trying to deflect responsibility for disembarkation. But we have very recently the example of Indonesia, Malaysia, agreeing to disembarkation and they did it in a way that identified refugees, in a way that identified people who may have contracted COVID-19. Tests were available, quarantine was made available, and a safe entry into the countries. The point here being, it was a lot smarter to do it that way. In other words, to agree to disembarkation in a managed way, open borders for people who are at risk, to enter than to pretend borders can be absolutely closed and uh, having a more chaotic and less managed, less safe way for people to, in desperation, seek access to the territory. COVID-19, I think, is um, showing us that there are real limits to this um, uh, notion that we've created that borders can actually uh, be completely, I have only the French term in mind, étanche, can absolutely be closed, putting up walls, uh, etc. But at, in, in effect, borders are never that absolute. They need management. They need to be uh, managed in a way where people who need access are identified and are put through systems that actually keep everyone safe uh, rather than um, a, a complete bar. COVID-19, I think, will be a real testament to how countries come together and understand that harmonizing our policies, our border policies, harmonizing our, our um, public health policies um, have ripple effects and are the only way to tackle a pandemic, which by definition is international, knows no borders, and certainly a pandemic that hasn't discriminated uh, between nationalities. I don't want to draw you, uh, Louise, into uh, into political deep waters, but um, Australia has a proud record in, in being involved in peacekeeping operations over the years, but it has also been in recent times reducing its foreign aid uh, budgets, and it has, to a certain degree, arguably reduced some of its commitment to, uh, to some peace keeping operations, uh, what do you see our role most usefully uh, being in, in these times and, and the, the immediate foreseeable future? What's the best we can do? Well, um, what you can continue, uh, certainly, and it's something that, uh, yes, Australia has a very proud record. And I know this uh, firsthand. As I said, I've, I've been working for UNHCR for over 20 years. Australia has been, in most every um, refugee, large-scale refugee situation I've been in, side by side with UNHCR, discussing not just with UNHCR, but with our NGO partners and with refugees themselves. Um, the, you know, uh, Australia is a donor to the UN, is a donor to UN programs, and essentially also a donor, a very key donor, to UNHCR programs for, for refugees. What do those programs do? They prepare refugees for solutions because being a refugee in and of itself is protective, but is not a solution. People want to return home, or people need to settle somewhere durably and resume a normal life anticipate a, a future for themselves, for their children. Programs, therefore, require that, you know, refugees are integrated in, um, you know, uh, quality education programs, health, um, public health uh, services, that they so also... So if, develop... if, if I can interrupt you and take you back to the question, I suppose, oh. then, is what do you <laughs> see Australia's role as being? Is it providing money through these agencies or is there 
is there a more physical role that uh, that it, it, it needs to project out to the world? So it can continue giving money. It also, I think, is a very strong voice in global fora, interestingly, for um, international solidarity efforts. And I point to something very tangible, the adoption of the Global Compact on Refugees, which is, you know, in many ways, groundbreaking. We have the convention that protects refugees that Australia has signed on to back, you know, um, for decades now. A global compact on refugees is meant to bring about the idea that alone one country cannot face a refugee influx, nor can resolve it. That we need more than states to be able to address refugee, long-standing refugee issues. We need the private sector, we need financial institutions, we need creativity, and we need a whole of society approach. And Australia bought into this. Australia fundamentally believes, and I think, you know, um, to put a, a, a much more positive spin in the concerns that Australia has about asylum and refugees, it, it, it sometimes portrays um, the idea that, you know, everyone wants to come to uh, Australia. I should, you know, reassure everyone, not every refugee wants to come here. It's pretty far. It's dangerous. Um, and, and there are other board, most refugee, more than 85% of the world's refugees actually are next door to their country of origin, oftentimes in developing countries. So not everyone wants to come here. But the concern that Australia has, has is, must we, show, we, must we shoulder the whole burden? Again, the burden is not on developed countries, it's on developing countries. Australia bought into this international solidarity notion in concrete terms. So it is, you know, joining in on platforms that we've established. Susan might know, you know, we've established a global platform for academics. What new research is out there? What works to either bring um, protection to refugees or to solve refugee issues? We've um, created um, platforms for financial institutions, philanthropists, um, the, the private sector. And again, here, Australian companies are joining. Some of them are even offering employment to refugees and bringing them from abroad specific skills to be able to come to Australia. I think, finally, to, and to make sure I do uh, answer your, your question, you write you to bring me back on track. And um, Australia's political voice. And when I say political voice, it's that constructive voice, a voice that brokers dialogue. It's not for nothing that Australia is part of consultative fora to discuss the decades-long Afghan situation. It's not for nothing that Australia is very invested in ensuring that there is dialogue between Myanmar and Bangladesh. It's not just because they're in the Asia uh, region. Australia is also invested in many of these efforts through the UN um, and other regional mechanisms to be able to address, you know, long-standing conflicts that yielded too many refugees who are still in limbo. Now, I would Could thank I you for that answer. I, I, that? Sure, I, I, I want to take some that? questions, but you go you go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've invited people to throw some questions, so I'll try to get to those. But you go ahead just for now, uh, Susan. Just 20 seconds to say, I, I, one thing that Louise said that really struck me, which is that there can be a possible positive way to think about COVID if it is viewed as the thing that we all need to unify together to fight against. And the, what made me think of that is your example about Australia working on other issues that way on, the, for example, the Global Compact of Refugees, which is this recognition that this is a global issue that needs to be addressed, not just by one country. And if there is the possibility for, you can call it a new world order, or you can call it a more peaceful time, if there is a way that COVID-19 is viewed as something that together countries unify to solve, this, this, this is potentially the positive way forward. I, I also know a little bit about Myanmar. And one, one example I would give is that this is a country that has been torn by ethnic conflict within. And now what we see, although not so much with the Rohingya, but with some of the other ethnic minorities, is in the context of COVID, 
these ethnic minorities are saying, together, we need to work together with the government on our responses to COVID. So I just wanted to kind of, I was quite up to the pessimistic before I wanted to throw a bit of a, a positive spin on that after hearing what Louise said. Some golden threads in a difficult year. Um, we are going to take some questions. We have some already, but first of all, I'd like to uh, play a video which contains a question. It's from Lucy Stronach, who is the 2021 Australian UN Youth Representative, and she put her question on video. Hi everyone, my name is Lucy Stronach and I'm the 2021 Australian Youth Representative to the United Nations. I had a question for the panel, which is specifically, how can young people assist in fostering more peaceful attitudes and practices? And is there a space for young people to be involved in peace building institutions to a greater capacity? Thank you. Over to you, Susan. <laughs> Um, my children just got home and are having such a big fight outside my door. Um, can you? We'll send some blue helmets around. <laughs> like here I am talking about peace and it is not going well outside my door. <laughs> the cobblers, yes, the cobblers' children always have uh, faulty shoes. I think is the is the thing. I, I that's Louise. <laughs> Did you hear that yes, question? No. Did you? I certainly did, and I'm um, I'm delighted you put someone useful on this panel. I mean, no disregard to anyone on this panel. Lucy, Lucy, your question is um, is spot on, and it's uh, more than legitimate. It's actually there, there's nothing more inspiring than uh, the actual actions that uh, youth across the world have not waited for the UN or anyone else to give them voice. They've actually as you know, um, took center stage, take climate action, uh, take gender equality, take uh, the rights for LGBTI individuals. Those are all of those issues, and I, I, I can continue down the list, all of those issues you know, have been spearheaded by youth. I think part of your question is uh, that's all fine, uh, they've got a lot of ideas and they're actually uh, driving home priorities for the rest of the world to be able to align next to. What about these, plat where do they speak? Where do we create space and, and, and formal structures to, for them to actually be able to have an active voice? I think um, more definitely needs to be done. Like I say, youth don't wait around for us to connect them yeah. together, etc. They, they take up those means. But it, within our formal institutions, I think more and more, there's a realization that the place for youth must be reserved and it is a privileged space. Taking the example of UNHCR, in the last few years, we conducted global dialogues with refugee, displaced and stateless youth on every continent. Uh, we created uh, regional committees and supported them for, for that. And now we have a global youth advisory group um, that advises our High Commissioner for Refugees on refugee displacement and, and statelessness issues. Representation there is also as per you know what youth groups want they want this to be rotational they want this to be representative uh, they want this to be a real um, cross-section of society in terms of age gender and the very diverse uh, personal characteristics of individuals so we've never been more challenged and i think inspired by actually um, bringing in youth in our formal policy and decision-making structures I really thank Lucy and um, I hope she keeps us honest on this and follows up on this because this is the only way forward is actually um, listening to um, our young people. Absolutely. I hope she has a great year as the uh, Australian UN Youth Representative. We're almost out of time, but uh, uh, and a number of questions have come through. I'll, I'll try this one. With World War II 75 years behind us, do you think we've forgotten the real value of peace and uh, take it for granted? Susan. Uh, no, I think that that is a very, um, that's an inaccurate way to think about conflict. I mean, World War II is certainly the conflict that has most affected Australians, but in, 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 since World War II, the conflict has been horrible in the world. It may be here in Australia that um, peace has been taken for granted. So maybe that was the, the, the question of the, the point of the questioner. 
Um, on that point, I think I think it's I think it's possible. Um, you can probably tell from my accent I'm an American, and I'm we are we are at a moment in America where civic violence is increasing in incredibly difficult and troubling ways. Um, there are pockets of violence that are coming from groups that have been deeply, deeply marginalized. Um, that violence is now being politicized and used instrumentally by other sections of the population. Um, and I think, I think we, as Australians and frankly as um, members of the Global North, we need to be looking very, very carefully to ensure that we continue to value peace. I, I'm, I've now gone from pessimistic to optimistic, and I'm swinging back to pessimistic again when I say that I think we really have to keep our eyes on it. I hope that we can continue to um, have gratitude for peace. I, I fear that we we are taking a bit, um, taking it for granted too much. We are out of time. Uh, I apologize uh, for uh, not having longer to uh, to chat to you both and to hear your insights. And I apologize to those who sent in questions, many of them and all of them good ones, and we won't get to them. And my apologies for that. But however, I won't apologize for the conversation. Louise Alban, so good to talk to you today. Uh, Dr. Susan Banky, so good as well. I'm going to hand us back Thank now you. to uh, Amit uh, from the Affinity Foundation. Thank you, my esteemed cousin uh, Hugh. Good evening, everyone, and my, my newly extended families, uncles, aunties, and cousins. Thank you for virtually joining tonight. I am delighted to be collaborating this event with UNAA New South Wales, UNHCR, and the Sydney Peace Foundation. First and foremost, I would like to thank Ms. Louise Oban and Dr. Susan Banke for enlightening us with an insightful and significant conversation in recognition of International Peace Day. Your contributions to our society in promoting and raising peace, harmony and diversity are invaluable. Thank you to my esteemed cousin Hugh for facilitating tonight's webinar. I would also like to extend my appreciation to those who have been working hard in the background. My cousins, Patricia, Joshua, and Tim, Susan and Archie, Naomi, Najid, Jade, and Ayn. Finally, I would like to sincerely thank Affinity's new advisory board member, my cousin, Craig Foster, for the welcoming of the program. Indeed, it is evident that the world's restless for peace. Peace is essential for the well-being of a democratic, pluralistic society in which people live freely and in harmonious coexistence. We have gathered here tonight to take a unified step for world peace through an open, considerate discussion. Once again, we have seen the fruits that coming together and establishing dialogue can nurture for this great cause. As we stride further into the 21st century and the world looks more like a global village, interfaith and intercivilizational dialogue have become particularly important. Letting go of confrontation and establishing understanding and connection between peoples are especially important today as we try not only to peaceful coexistence, but try to solve shared problems such as COVID-19 and global warming. We hope to build sustainable peace in every corner of the world, free from favoritism and discrimination. A golden principle that rests at the core of such an endeavor is to remember that first and foremost, we are all human and only then do our other identities come into place. This emphasizes the intrinsic value that all people carry and the impartial need for peace that we all have and should collaborate to fulfill. Let us remember a few of the peace pioneers by paying tribute to all who have devoted themselves to the principles of peace, democracy, 
social justice and equal, uh, equal such as uh, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Francis Crowe, and other honorary individuals. They chose reconciliation over retaliation, and in doing so, set an example of living a noble life of coexistence for the next generation. As we remember the lessons and wisdom they left behind, we must reaffirm our commitment to the dignity of all humans and to our shared values of peace, mutual understanding and respect through open dialogue. To the end of to the end of the night, I would like to share with you Affinity's upcoming webinar. On the 29th of September, Affinity and the Institute for Economics and Peace will proudly present their third webinar episode. Join my cousin Charlie Allen, APM, Director of Partnership at the Institute for Economics and Peace, and doc my cousin, Dr. Julian Drogan, Senior Lecturer at Macquarie University, as they discuss the launch of the Ecological Threat Register. For further information regarding this webinar, please have a look at Affinities or IPS website. Thank you, our listeners from home and our distinguished speakers and supporters. I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.